1 through 4. And my uh, message tonight, just a question, is there any room in your heart for Jesus? Amen. Is there any, or is there any room for Jesus in your heart? <laughs> Either way, okay, it's a question mark. Any room for Jesus in your heart? Amen. It is the Christmas season. People's minds are focused on the commercial aspects of the season, the getting and the receiving of gifts and the frenzy of Santa Claus and no room for thinking about Jesus in their minds, mostly. Hmm. So I want to preach just a simple five-part message tonight, not real lengthy in each of the parts, okay? I want to go clear back to the beginning of the scripture, in the Garden of Eden. You know, it was a perfect setting. There was no room for sinners in the Garden of Eden. Move over six chapters, Genesis 6, there was no room for sinners in the ark either. Let's move over to the New Testament. There was no room in the inn for Jesus. It leads me to ask the question, is there any room in your heart right now for Jesus? And depending on your answer for that, whether there's any room in Father's house or not for you. Amen. So that's just basically in a nutshell of what we want to bring to you this evening. The scripture. Can we stand for the reading of the scripture here this evening? And let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Now, I could read on further, and one of the disciples, Thomas, interrupted and said, how do you think we know the way? And Jesus looked at Philip and said, Philip, have I been all this time with you and still you don't know who I am? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Lord Jesus, tonight, ask your presence be with us in the delivery of this message that you put upon our heart. Amen, Lord. Help our hearts to be prepared for lots of you, Jesus, especially in the season that we're in. Lord, we've already just given a little indication that people's hearts and minds are all about commercial things and the getting and receiving gifts, and probably you're far from their hearts and minds, and they're looking for a Santa Claus. That's not us tonight, Lord. I pray there's room in our heart for you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Any room for Jesus in your heart or any room in your heart for Jesus? The word room you won't find in uh, the Bible in the context that I'm talking about this evening, space, okay? Uh, especially or in the King James Version, you might find it in some other translations. But in Genesis chapter 3, it's interesting uh, to note there that it was the Garden of Eden. It was a paradise. God was in control of it, and he placed a man and woman in the garden there to keep it and whatnot. And there was only... One command uh, as far as a negative for Adam Eve, thou shalt not, and there was only one. Now, everything going for, for them, literally the whole wide world in their hands. And Brother Dave was talking tonight about things that's going on in the world and not a good place to be except here in New Brunswick thus far. And I do believe our country's in for trouble. Yeah. You see the way it's going and people's hearts are are uh, not towards God at all. But literally, Adam and Eve had everything going for them in a paradise. It wasn't overpopulated. There was no such thing as global warming. <laughs> there was no crime and there was no war, and no pestilence and no famine. There wasn't any unemployment and no bullying. No mortgage and no crooked pol politicians. <laughs> no Euro crisis. There was no ISIS nor threat to a peaceful society. They had it made in the Garden of Eden. All they had to do was obey the one command of the Lord, do not eat of the fruit that's in the 
midst of the garden, and that tree has a name, the knowledge of good and evil. Of that, thou shalt not partake. Help yourself to whatever. Very small restriction, really. A very small rule. And uh, they had the rest of creation at their disposal. However, as humanity is bent on disobedience, the one simple command was not heeded. Rather, it was disobeyed. And both Adam and Eve fell from grace or the unmerited favor of our God. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7, Paul made something clear that there are consequences for doing wrong. Now, every man, and that includes woman, all right, that uh, does not do right, the scripture says they reap what they sow. Adam and Eve had sowed disobedience and they reaped rejection and were cast out of the garden. Let me emphasize this tonight. God cannot and will not compromise with sin. There was no room in this paradise for sin. And Adam and Eve disobeyed it, mean they could not stay there any longer. Now, too bad for us. You say, why? We're the descendants of Adam and Eve. That we should have learned from their mistake and humbly repent of our sins and our trespasses. But how is it that humanity as a whole seems bent on reaping the sins and the iniquities of our forefathers? There's a scripture that we should also be aware of in its first John chapter 1 and 9, and many of you can quote it, it tells us that if we would confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Now, when it says all sin, that's any sin, big or small, cleansed from unrighteousness. So remember. In the paradise of the Garden of Eden, there was no room for sin. God will not tolerate it. Now, remember, when Jesus came to this earth, he didn't come for the good as such. He came to die for the sinful, to make us good. And so I asked you the question, and that's going to be asked to you five times before I'm done here tonight. Is there any room in your heart for Jesus? Moving on to Genesis chapter 6, there was no room in the ark for sinners either. People in Noah's day did not have the law of God as we know it, Ten Commandments. It was before that time. Moses hadn't even been born yet. All right? But there still existed a moral law that was written in every man's heart. Isn't it amazing that within every soul there is a sense of right and wrong? How did that get there? It was placed there by God himself when you were created in the womb. Praise the Lord. So inasmuch as your brain was put in your head by God as well, there's an empty spot in your heart that's to be inhabited by him and him only. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. Notice what it says here. He hath made everything beautiful in his time also. He has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You can't figure God out. There's a sense of eternity with God. And he did design from the beginning that you would spend eternity with him until man sinned and fell and was cast out of the garden. So here we are now moving on and it's Noah now. And Noah had a... Can I put it, a God-shaped hole in his heart <laughs> uh, to do what was right, and it was filled with God. And Noah and his family were saved and spared in that wicked time. All others on the planet were lost. Now, in a sense, and they did not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or the living God. Hence, there was no room for them in the ark, and they all perished and drowned. Now, the ark was big enough to hold more than Adam and his family. And two of every unclean animal and seven of every clean, there was still more room in the ark than that. 
And uh, when it began to rain, I can almost picture people coming and knocking on the door of the ark saying, let us in, let us in. There's got to be more room in there. We've seen you build such a huge thing. How come so big? And uh, they knocked on the door. But you see, God shut the door. And Noah and his family was inside that ark. Now, it didn't look like Noah was too successful of a preacher. Well, the ark was preparing, and that was 120 years. It says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He's preaching to turn from your sinful ways and return unto the living. And it was a wicked day. We're only talking six chapters in. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, from when uh, God had made everything good in the paradise and Adam fell. Now look what's happening. And wickedness was on every man's heart. And the Lord said, I'm going to destroy them from off of the face of the earth. But I'm going to make provision for the righteous. He made a way out for the righteous. And it was the ark. We find only eight souls that were saved by the ark. Noah and his family. There was only two options. It was either the ark or the water. Take your choice. You know, it almost makes as much sense. There was another boat in early 1900s, I think it was called the Titanic. You know, when people discovered that that ship was going down, it didn't do any good to change seats. (laughs) What they needed to do was change ships, (laughs) right? No good to just change seats on the same thing that's sinking. All right? But anyway, no room. In that ark for sin, just eight righteous souls. Let's move on over into the New Testament in Matthew and Luke's account of the birth of Jesus Christ. And it tells us there was no room for Mary and Joseph in the inn. Mary was very heavy with child, a special child, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He was worthy to be born in a palace, but we see him born in. In a stable, that's verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. Why was he born a step? Because there was no room for Jesus in the inn or the palace, so to speak. After the Roman census was ended, and that's why Mary and Joseph was in the town of Bethlehem to register there. When everybody went back to their own places, I'm sure there were accommodations that were freed up, allowing Mary and Joseph to move into the inn in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And they actually got moved in just in time for a visit from the Magi from the east. But when Jesus was born, there was no room in the inn. So, and when people celebrate Christmas today, I wonder how many have room for Jesus, or is it all for Santa Claus? Oh, there's room for 10 or 12 reindeer, but no room for someone that could change their life. In John chapter 8, verse 47, Jesus spoke of some Jews that were gathered together in the Mount of Olives, and it says there that many believed in him, but there were some that did not believe in him. And the reason they didn't believe in him, they said uh, they were the children of Abraham. Yeah, this was the hope of Abraham. Down the line, they, did, they missed it, who he really was. So to them, the religious people, Jesus uh, wasn't the Messiah, and they had no room for him or for his word. And Jesus, in turn, spoke to them and says, because you have no room for my word in your heart, you don't even belong to God. Today... A lot of folks have no room for Jesus in their heart either or the word of God. I mean, we see church buildings that are not full and if there were, the backsliders would all return. The churches couldn't hold the many that's out there, right? What's happening? People want their own uh, buffet style religion, pick and mix and take what you want and leave the rest. You know, sort of like changing seats on the Titanic. You know, a man made a false religion. It doesn't matter where they sat on that boat. They were going to perish, right? And can I tell you, the word says that uh, there's only one way. There's only one door. There's only one way in. 
And as Jesus said, if a man tries to crime, crawl up any other way, he's a thief and a robber. Thief and robbery is sin in the books. And there's no room for sin in the Garden of Eden. There isn't in the ark. And there isn't in the church or in the synagogue. And really shouldn't be any in your heart either. If there is, you're on your way for destruction. All four accounts of the gospel report that there was no room in this earth for the Christ child that was to be born. Now, he was here for 30 to 33 years. He performed healings. He performed miracles. There were signs. There was wonders. He was a moral teacher, and probably people could accept it if that's all there was to it, but there was more to it than that. He was the Savior of the world, and he required people to do something. Now, he had a, quite a large following when there was loaves and fishes, and he was blessing and multiplying, and people's physical needs were being met. But when he hauled out the book, so to speak, and began to preach doctrine and to teach, they forsook him. We have no room in our heart for that stuff. They rejected the Messiah the Savior, the Son of God, God in flesh. And it's much the same today. In the book of Acts, we find the Apostle Paul, he was going from place to place trying to establish some search, churches, and in each city he went, he went to the synagogues first, and synagogues where you should find some Christians, <laughs> but there was people called the Essens, there were others called the Zealots, and then more uh, more known to us was the scribes and the Pharisees, and maybe I'll put the hypocrites in there too, the religious elite. To these religious folk, there was no room for a Savior called Jesus. Now, if they'd have come preaching a sect or a cult called Jesus, they might have got it across. But he was known to the world as the Savior. Well, we don't have any room for that. We're Abraham's kids. Romans 6 14 and 15. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, previously in this chapter, Paul was building up in an argument. Uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And you are... Uh, a slave to the one to whom you yield your members' instruments to obey. right? Rather unto death and sin or unto life in Christ Jesus. I want Christ Jesus to live in my heart. And if Christ lives in my heart, sin shall not have dominion over me. I can take you over to 1 John. The child of God doth not commit sin. Now that might be contrary to some teaching today. Wrote sinning and thought and word every day. <laughs> and I believe it's, it's, it's possible to live above reproach. How is it possible? By the Holy Spirit that's placed on the inside of us. <laughs> Amen. The power that Brother Murray just talked about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 20, I believe is that verse. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask according to the power that works within what's the power that's working within it's christ spirit in you the hope of glory christ spirit in you no room for sin in fact the spirit of god won't coexist with sin and so i'm asking is there any room in your heart for jesus there was no room in the hearts of men and women in christ day as he walked upon this earth so let's move on here just a little bit and go to the end of the New Testament. The good news of the gospel had been preached. It was Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, verse 2, which was part of our text, it said, In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. You were meant to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. You really were. And he's been preparing for over 2,000 years. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's an awesome place. And if you can read it in, the, uh, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 about a city. <laughs> Amen. There are streets of gold, walls of jasper, rivers as clear as crystal, 
Gates of pearl, one solid pearl. Murray and I was talking about that earlier in the week. Can you imagine the size of the oyster to get one solid pearl as a gate? And do you know how oysters create that pearl? It's over some little piece of sand or an irritation. And when that muscle forms around that and gets real hard, and that's how a pearl is formed. And it talks about the gates made out of one solid pearl. I can't even imagine that with my finite human mind. It's going to be a grand place. It talks about 12,000 miles or, or furlongs, long, wide, and high. If you do the math on that and set a bungalow on the inside, there's room for more than enough bungalows to seat and live 6 billion people. Lots of room in heaven. There's lots of room in the ark. There was lots of room in the garden. <laughs> There's lots of room in heaven, and there will be lots of room when you and I get there. You say, why? I'm going to have more than one bungalow because someone forfeited theirs. I'm telling you the truth. What happened? Because there was no room in their heart for the Lord. Therefore, he will not allow them in that beautiful place. We need to make room in our hearts for Jesus so that there will be room for us in heaven, to spend eternity with him. And so I close, and it's a very simple message here tonight. Is there any room in your heart for Jesus? There better be. If there's no room in your heart for Jesus, there's lots of room for sin. But there can't be both. Amen. It's either sin or it's Jesus. Amen. We need to get rid of the sin. He actually died to take care of that. If we'll avail ourselves to the gospel, good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want Christ in me to take every bit of sin out of me so I can spend eternity in heaven. Lots of room up there if there's room in my heart now. Would you stand tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen, Jesus. Amen, Lord. We preach the word of the Lord in a very simple message tonight. Look from Genesis through to Revelation. How, Lord, there was no room in a perfect garden for sin. There was no room in a ark that flowed in water for sin. And there was no room on this earth for the Christ child who was going to look after sin, and they rejected him. So we actually reap the uh, benefits or the consequences of that sin. Lord, I want to obey your gospel so that that don't get me. I want room in my heart so there's actually room for me in heaven. Yeah, Lord. Tonight, Lord, as we've gathered together and it is the Christmas season, help us to be all the more conscious of the reason for the season. And it was the Christ child, the one that we celebrate's birth, Jesus during this season, I want you to be first and foremost in my heart when everybody else is looking for Santa Claus. When everybody else is looking for commercialized gifts, you were the greatest gift to mankind. I thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's not a price tag going to be put upon it. Thank you for the victory that helps us to overcome the world so there's not sin in our heart, but rather there's room for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise God. Would you take some time tonight and come forward and let's pray on this altar before we leave tonight and give thanks to the Lord and assure him again that there's room in your heart for him. Would you do that? Amen. Let's come. Let's gather together.